All right, here we go. The end of June 2024 is approaching here. And, of course, with the Olympics coming up, that's kind of all you hear about. And, of course, the Tour de France is starting tomorrow, which is not a cross-country mountain bike topic. I hear that. But I'm still excited for it, so I thought I'd uh, get some news and things out of the way this week. And we do have a, uh, I call it the last World Cup uh, next week in Leger, because then we head to North America and half the people don't even go to those races. So uh, let's get going. This is Short Travel Magazine. Changing gears. More new stuff we don't really need. All right, we're going to start out this week talking about something probably very few people even think about, but I come across this topic once in a while that is the idea of using a steel bike for a modern cross-country type uh, of a racing bike and of course I think that's probably about as rare as you can get I don't know of anybody certainly none of the big companies actually making a steel uh, full suspension bike suitable for cross-country racing now there's plenty of them of course i've seen a lot of these weird little small brands that are making these uh, enduro type bikes or downhill bikes where weight is not really an issue they just i mean everybody knows steel bikes way more there's no question about that you hear a lot of this steel is real stuff uh, honestly i only rode steel bikes now, granted that it was custom steel and probably some of the better uh, thinner tubing at the time all the way from 91 until 2016 so 20 no, how many years is that can't really be 25 years oh my goodness 25 years I mainly only rolled two bikes in 25 years if that's believable it's probably a shock to many people I know people who Every two or three years, are getting a new bike. Uh, my first steel bike was in 91. I rode that till 2000. Then I got another custom steel bike from the same guy, Kurt Little Cycles. He's now up in Washington State, used to be from uh, Southern California. And he made me another one, which ooh, at the time it was a soft tail. It had, I think it's got, I still, I still have it. I use it as my Zwift indoor training bike I think it's maybe one inch in the back of travel I don't even think it's one inch it might be half an inch or something uh, you know elastomer soft tail bike with uh, flexible if I remember they were Ritchie chain stays that they were made just for the purpose of uh, soft tail so they could flex a little more than normal and I rode that bike through many well not that many many variations all the way until 2016 when I finally decided I was old and needed some more uh, cushion than the 80 mil fork and half inch or so uh, rear end allowed so and of course it was 26 inch wheels where am I going with all this uh, rambling nonsense uh, Sauer a bike from a bike brand in Germany released what they're calling a uh, cross-country-ish full suspension bike and it actually looks from the naked eye like a modern cross-country bike I said eh, let me let me refrain from saying modern it's it's got the uh, shock in the vertical position attached to the bottom bracket uh, courtesy uh, of the giant uh, and older Trek top fuel actually the one I have they actually the top fuels current are still like that there are a few bikes, not in the cross-country world so much, that have the uh, shock vertical mounted, uh, you know, to the bottom bracket area, thus giving you only one water bottle. And this is the case. Now, I still have been in contact, although not very often, with uh, Doug Curtis from Kurt Low Cycles, who's been building 
custom bikes for almost probably 40 years now. I've known him ever since I got that first bike. I built his websites for him and he built me a couple bikes and just a very nice guy. But he he did full suspension bikes for many years. He probably still would build one. But he had to attach uh, the rear end, the entire rear swing arm, chainstay, seat stay, shock mount were aluminum made by Ventana, who's still a bike brand, still offering the same system. And it too is a uh, shock, vertical shock mounted to the bottom bracket, thus giving you only one water bottle mount on most frames. Uh, so I never really had him build me that bike, although I kind of wish now that I did. Uh, I, I, I should have had him build me a 29er with that system back when I bought my Trek in 2016. But as with most builders, there was a quite a long wait. And honestly, I've only had frames where I built them up myself, and I just kind of didn't want to deal with putting it all together. I didn't even, I, I've never had a bike, I remember. Never had a bike with 29 wheels, disc brakes, one and a, one, what is it, one eighth to one and a half inch head tubes. Um, never, never had a bike with one by. What else could I go on and on? I never had, I mean, this, in 2016, the top fuel was like an alien bike. Everything was different on it. I, there wasn't really, aside from the seat and the grips maybe, and the seat, no, not even the seat post, that it, that size changed. Uh, there, that's about all I could actually move over from any of my other bikes um, onto the new one. So I just decided to buy an all-in, go buy a whole bike. I found that one at a Trek dealer. So Sauer is doing the steel um, mountain bike, and I don't know, it looks really cool. Now, the weight is, of course, several pounds. It's not a matter of, you know, one pound or something. It, no, it's like three three to four pounds heavier in some cases. Uh, but I, I next time I talk to my buddy Doug, I am going to run it by him and say, what's your thought on building a lightweight, whatever that means for a steel, uh, cross-country type bike uh, where weight is kind of the issue? I know there are some tubings they can use that are lighter, uh, a.k.a. thinner. Uh, maybe they're double or triple butted. And see what he says. Probably still have to use a Ventana rear end, which is okay, but I really want the two water bottle mounts. But since he can put bottle mounts anywhere I want, maybe I will have him attach something to the under the top tube or somewhere, somewhere different, somewhere where he can maybe fit two in. But anyway, so that's my project for the future is a steel cross country bike, 120 mil travel, maybe at the most, uh, 110 possibly front and rear so that's kind of cool anyway uh so check that out sour which of course you probably never heard of i never heard of but when painted up looks pretty nice um some new carbon wheels there are so many what is with all the new hubs lately anybody notice that uh the one up or is that how you say it? yeah one no one up isn't that the same as one up bike racks it just occurred to me the one up of the seat post dropper, and uh, they've got their own hubs now, and they're lighter, cheaper than DT, yada, yada, yada. Everybody talks about DT being the standard. Um, DT does have some new 1200 wheels out, the XRC 1200, and they actually are quite heavy 1400 and something grams, I believe they are, and that's for their, you know, super light race wheels. And front and back, you know, you're approaching three grand still. That's a hard sell. I don't, I don't know who's paying that for those type of wheels. There are so much lighter uh, wheels out there that you can get built up. But, you know, some people just like to buy all-in-one wheels. I admit I would not know exactly what to do with the custom wheels unless I had somebody who's built a few thousand of them who I do know a guy who built me wheels, but I don't know what he could do to compete with uh, the stock DT XRC 1200 type wheels. But I guarantee you they would be lighter. And I'm guessing probably at least a thousand bucks cheaper. So not sure who that 
who that buyer is almost still to this day and things have come down in the carbon wheel world almost three grand for a set of wheels that weigh 1400 plus grams even 1300 grams seems like a lot so those are not going to be bought anytime soon speaking of expensive bike parts let's talk about some new brake pads um i don't know if any of you've heard of the absolute black brand it's kind of a high-end brand of stuff and they have a new uh brake pads yeah wow brake pads right most people i know just they have xt brakes they just buy shimano brake pads and stick them in there you do see a lot of the galfer brand uh, which are european uh, brake company they make a lot of pads for motorcycles and things so you see you know you see a fair amount of those on team bikes because they are sponsoring quite a few uh cross-country mountain bike teams on the world cup so you see that and those decals on their bikes but absolute blacks think that they think they got it figured out here we're talking you ready for this 50 bucks you read that right 50 bucks the road ones are 63 bucks per wheel for brake pads now they do look really cool i will be the first to admit they're uh, calling them graphene pads so if you look up absolute black graphene g-r-a-p-h-e-n you will see them they have but roughly around 50 to 60 bucks per wheel so you're looking at 120 dollars worth of brake pads that's pretty much as much as you could get a decent uh lower end shimano or sram brake uh but you know they make all kinds of claims I, th- to me the claim is hey these look really cool and the the pad itself sticks quite a far way out of the caliper i mean you could the top of the caliber is another inch sticking out on top so you'll see these things a mile away and that's probably half of the allure is oh look at look at my 60 dollar brake pads so uh, that's the last thing though i would be playing around with um but you know their claim to fame is i don't know how to say this dude's name tadaj pogaccia you know the dude at the tour de france since they're using them on Team UAE at the Tour de France, you know, I'm sure there's plenty of road dudes who would go, oh, well, what's another 100 bucks for some brake pads? Uh, these are really cool. So they'll sell out. They'll probably uh, won't be able to keep up with demand. Uh, let's talk about something kind of dumb. Although we'll see how you think if it's dumb or not. Uh, anybody here, which is just me because I'm the only one here, uh, ever try lubing their uh, stanchions on their fork or the rear shock um, I don't have a dropper seat post but this would apply to that too um, you know you think well if there's oil and lube in there you shouldn't have to lube your forks in that way but uh, x sauce who is a brand you see in Europe they're in Spain they're like a finish line uh, type of a thing. They're all kinds of lubes and cleaners. They don't really make components. They make oils and greases and that type of thing. Um, but, you know, you see them a lot. And if you look at the World Cup pits, you'll see they usually have tents. Uh, and they're supporting a lot of the uh, European riders. But they have something they're calling, I believe it is not a stanchion uh, lube. They're calling it a seal lubricant. But you basically dump it on your fork legs and it kind of drips down into your seals and keeps them extra slippery. Now, I've tried this. Finish Line makes a product. At least they did. I I have one. It's a very tiny, tiny little bottle. I'm literally like an inch inch high in in height for a bottle of oil. And then like a strange kind of uh, microfiber towel, very small towel, maybe four inches by six inches and you're supposed to wipe your uh, fork legs down the stanchions with that and it makes them super duper duper slippery and I will admit I don't know what's in that stuff it is extremely slippery and uh, literally one drop I'm not exaggerating one drop is all you need on this towel to uh, polish up your rear shock and your fork uh, stanchions Now, is that the same as seal lubricant? I don't know, but it really does a nice job. The problem is it wears off 
in one ride, basically. So, and in theory, you know, they say it does attract dirt, but I, I that was never a problem. Uh, it just wore off and it would feel and look normal again. But I'm curious if uh, anybody else has ever tried that because it, for, a, for a while, for a few hours anyway, it really is nice and your fork does kind of, you know, I don't say it feels new, but it's kind of newish and it's cool. Um, so if you ever get a chance to try any of that, it may, may not be a, a bad idea. It's cheap, you know, less than 10 bucks. Uh, but most people I know don't do that. So be curious if anybody else has experimented with that. Uh, let's talk something kind of unmountain bikey. Uh, BMX racing, right? A lot of people, a lot, I wouldn't say a lot, but a fair amount of mountain bikers have a BMX history. I know a lot of the World Cup racers from the U.S. Uh, Chris Christopher Blevins, for example, he was a highly successful BMX racer. Pretty tall dude, too, so I wonder what he looked like riding a little 20-inch bike. But anyway, uh, I I started BMX racing in 19... mid... late 70s, 78, maybe, 77. That's where I really started kind of getting into bikes as a sport and less of just a way to get around with my buddies. Um, and so, of course, I'm, now that I'm older... A lot of people from my generation who grew up with the late 70s and the 80s BMX bikes all kind of have a soft spot for wanting to see them and rebuild them and purchase them. So there's a lot of old BMX brands who are re-releasing replica bikes. And some of them are darn good replicas. They are correct down to the bolts and the nuts and the seats and the tires. They've recreated, real, realistically, as close as you could, uh, a real, authentic 1970-something bicycle. Uh, Raleigh is doing it, and Haro, who doesn't really have much uh, action in the mountain bike world anymore. Uh, GT, uh I think Gary Turner of GT, I think his son, I believe, is now re-releasing real, quote, GT Chromali BMX bikes, and they look completely awesome. Torker is another brand uh, going way back. They just uh, re-released their whole brand new company. They have modern BMX bikes. They also have these incredibly accurate. Where am I going with all this? Uh, is it time to start releasing... This is going to be probably a no. Uh, some completely authentic early, late 80s and early 90s mountain bikes. Who wouldn't love to have, let's say, a, if you were a GT guy back in the day, a fully 100% authentic aluminum GT Zizang uh, hardtail. A Julie Furtado model or something uh, where they're, perfect down to the tires and the quick release skewers and the seat uh, or a Tomac. Everybody would love, I would love to see a full on reproduction of the uh, Tomac Raleigh bike complete with the uh, Tioga uh, disc in the back and the cool blue fork, the Tioga fork or were they no lean or something? I don't remember who made the fork. It was not Rock Shocks or anybody. Uh, so is it time to start seeing some of these brands coming out with these bikes? The only problem I can see is short of the hardtails, all the full suspension bikes were pretty much crap <laughs> and suspension forks were pretty much crap. Although I would love, wouldn't that be cool to see uh, Manitou or somebody come out with an exact replica of the original you know, Mag 21 from Rock Shocks, maybe with the option of putting a little better internals in there, but keeping them uh, that, I mean, I could see this. A lot of people are still paying big bucks for vintage mountain bike parts. I've been trying to piece together my 1991 hardtail um, and trying to find parts for it. Saddles and stems and seat posts is proving to be extremely difficult because uh, people are asking kind of silly silly amounts of money for 
an old stem or a, a beat up bottom bracket. Most of this stuff isn't even in good condition. So it's like I'm not paying 200 bucks for an Action Tech bottom bracket that looks like you threw it down the street a few hundred times. So uh, it may never happen. Uh, I wanted a lot of the 91, 92 uh, era parts on it. I have parts. I mean, I have stuff, but I, as I went, I replaced things. So the cranks are from, let's say, late 90s. Um, I, you know, I have the original Crossmax wheels, the very first kind of bla all blacked out, all-in-one wheels. I have a brand new set of those. For years, I've been sitting on them. But that's not early, early 90s. That's kind of mid to later 90s. So I'm not real sure exactly what to do. But I think that could be cool. And that's probably enough for the... I already talked about the 1UP hubs. Let's do some quick racing stuff. Racing news and views. Racing, racing. We're in the middle of summer, kind of. And most people probably didn't realize that there is a marathon mountain bike national championship right here in the USA. Um, I mean, marathon format barely gets any attention anyway, even throughout the world. But there was a national championships uh, two weeks ago, two weekends ago, in Alabama of all places. And I just happened to be looking at the um, winners, mainly because a youngish woman I met at the Iceman Cometh race in Michigan last November um, it was during a Meet the Pros. I'd never heard of her. She's kind of new on the scene from the East Coast. She posted that she was uh, going to be racing. She'd kind of be more of an enduro, marathonish type of a rider. Not really a cross-country, um, you know, sh short-distance type of a racer. Oh, she could probably do pretty good. But anyway, she was doing it, so I thought I'd follow up and... Uh, see who won. So Alexis Scarta won for the women, and everybody knows she has um, become more or less a gravel-type race, racer, not really a cross-country racer, although she obviously knows a way around a mountain bike. This is not meant as a disrespectful uh, statement for her, but she's not a cross-country mountain biker by trade. Hannah Otto got second. Now, she used to be a cross-country racer and did some World Cups. And she, too, has become a gravel, what I call a lifetime racer, which is pretty much gravel rider with an occasional mountain bike, quote-unquote, race, although those are usually long distance and not very technical. And she got second. So Carson Beckett, who I'm not familiar with, and Braden Lang um, got second for the men. So basically, I don't really know of any of the names except for those few who are a gravel uh, lifetime racer. So, But just the fact that they had one in Alabama, which is kind of a strange place. Um, you don't hear about a lot of races in Alabama. So that's over with. And the cross-country national championships, which are more interesting, are coming up the week before the Olympics, July 17th. Uh, you just don't hear very much about these races anymore because the action is not in cross-country racing in this country. It's gravel racing. But you will see, like right now, uh, Sevilla Blanc is wearing a National Champs jersey and Christopher Blevins is wearing one. So, I mean, these people are going now the question is both of those racers are going to the olympics i'm guessing they're going to sit this this one out maybe uh, unless they do this and then fly over the olympics interesting last year this national championship race did not have all the big guns in attendance i forget I forget why there was a big european race the same weekend or something but um kind of had that feeling of like uh, the big, big, big dogs in, the, in American cross country uh, were kind of blowing it off, which is fine. I mean, obviously Blevins was there and Sevilla was there. And Kate, if I remember Kate Courtney was there, I think she got second or third. 
So uh, you never know. But with the Olympics being a week after, uh, this might be a good chance for some other people to uh, grab the jersey. So it's going to be happening in Pennsylvania. And uh, there really isn't going to be any video, uh, no, you know, live streaming, I don't think. There usually isn't. Maybe Flow Bikes would have something. But so we got that to look forward to. Um, but then, of course, we go to Le, Le, you know, Le Gay. Le, no, Le Gay. I, Le Get, I don't know. France. Uh, it's the last World Cup this weekend. And then the last two, I believe this will be number six. I believe then there's only two left. That's funny. I used to have that memorized. Um, so, you know, there's still a lot in the line. Uh, Nino being in the lead right now for the men. He, he And he's in the Olympics, so I'm assuming he's going to show up next weekend and try and and win. And Pidcock's not going to be there. He's at the tour. So could, could Nino do the... Uh, 30, number 37. That would be really kind of cool to have two, two wins at least and the overall uh, for his 700th season. That's, that wouldn't be anything to, uh, to sneeze at. Uh, the Olympic team has released their outfits that they're going to wear at the Olympics. And I don't know. They're just basically white. They have these kind of gray... They're kind of boring, I'll be honest with you. They're just gray kind of square shapes all over them with a giant dark, dark, dark blue, almost black uh, USA. I mean, they're they're very simple and plain, and that's probably better than going goofy, but there's definitely uh, they have one flag on the upper left chest area, and that's pretty much it. No more, you know, some stars along the side under the arms, a couple stars, but... Um, the red, white, and blue kind of traditional stuff is is not there, and that's fine. I mean, it doesn't have to be, you know, crazy goofy every year with the flags and stuff. So, but um, the jerseys, at least for the the road and mountain biking, are so thin. And this is a trend I've seen in a lot of the racers in the last year or two. These jerseys are now so thin that they're literally transparent. Um. I'm looking at a, a woman here. I'm not sure who this is. I, this is a road racer of some, someone wearing the jersey. I could see her skin completely through the jersey. She's wearing like a black sports bra under it. And I, I mean, you could see it as if that's all she was wearing. I don't, I, is it a cooling thing? I get the cooling thing, why you'd want to be cool. But these jerseys are now are so transparent looking you can hardly see the graphics on it. I don't get it. Um, I'm not in charge of this stuff, obviously, but kind of stupid looking. Uh, I kind of like the jerseys that are jerseys with the printing on them. So at least I am cu was curious what they were going to look like. They do not look anything like, for example, what uh, Blevins and Blunk are wearing um, for national champs. I mean, those are kind of those are screaming stars and stripes, America. These are def definitely not screaming. Uh, so that's kind of interesting. Uh, what else? Um, speaking of Olympics, because I'm getting so tired of hearing about it, and here I am talking about it. Uh, Brian BS, as I'm calling him, Brian is a going to be a contributor to this channel very soon. Um, you'll learn more about him. In the next week or two, but uh, he is a rider from Arizona who reached out to me when I started this and has been nothing but nice and he's quite interesting and has exquisite taste in bike equipment. Let's just put it to you that way. And the means and desire to try things and buy all the coolest stuff. So I think it'd be really fun to talk to on here. So we're going to work that in. But... Um, the reason I bring it up is he is going to the Olympics. That's right. He's going to be there on family uh, with his family for something non-bike related, and he's going to be in, in Paris, and he's going to go. So I hope to see if we can't get some actual, quote-unquote, American on the ground. Uh, he's getting... 
I think he's going to go to the cross country race. At least I hope he is. And it'd be kind of cool to see uh, what he thinks. Maybe you can get some uh, video footage and do some FaceTiming or something. So that's kind of cool. Um, one article I read, uh, written from a Canadian outlet is, are the Olympics worth it? Meaning from the racers perspective and the people who do get to go, is it worth all the incredible amount of work and hype? And it was quite an interesting article hearing from the athletes who have went in 2021, for example, uh, Peter Dezera, who is one of the top mountain bikers from Canada. He went and it's was really interesting to hear him say, I worked my butt off to get, you know, to get the nomination to go, only to get there and basically crap it up and do terrible and know afterwards that he could have done better and he should have done better. It was interesting because you think, well, you know, some of the athletes are of the attitude, just getting there is a win. You know, I, I made it to the Olympics. And personally, I think that in itself is kind of a win. I mean, think of the experience of going to another country and going through the whole procedure with the Olympic team and the Olympic outfits and getting fitted and getting all the free stuff and the free trip and the room and board and the food and the, most of them get custom bikes made and painted and not even... Most, you know, the vast majority have no intention of actually winning a medal. Um, I'm sure a lot of them want to win a medal, but, you know, they don't. So, interesting. Something to think about when I'm watching the Olympics this year. I'll be thinking of all the athletes, a lot of them you never even heard of, uh, from the smaller countries because they don't do particularly well in the World Cup. So, therefore, they're not really mentioned, uh, yet they get to go to the Olympics because uh, they're one of the few racers from their country who are, are, in fact, trying to go. So that's kind of how I'm going to be looking at it this year. What else? That's it. Let's move on for some quick tidbits, and we'll wrap it up. Interesting tidbits. Curated just for you. All right. Even more Olympic talk. God, am I getting tired of talking about Olympic stuff. I really, I honestly, I hate, actually hate the years that the Olympic... Uh, races are happening because it's everything gets goofed up with the teams and the everybody blowing off races because they're preparing Every, everything's a disaster so these are not my favorite years um, but the reason I'm mentioning it again is I got an email from USA Cycling I had to join USA Cycling so I could do some races and not pay the now $15 per race one day fee it used to be 10 bucks a day if you didn't have a USA license to race, and I calculated out, I don't do enough races in the year to warrant buying a membership, but I did because uh, they offered it to me for half price, and it was only 40 bucks or something. So now I'm getting all their emails about stuff uh, that I don't really have any intention of taking uh, part of, but they did have a deal where if you want to go to the Olympics, they have a package where you get to go and you stay in a luxury hotel. They serve you meals from a gourmet chef, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And you don't have to travel. They have like a shuttle that will take you to all of the cycling races. You get passes and tickets to all of the cycling races you want to go to. And they let you borrow a custom, I believe it was a Pinarello road bike, and go on rides with... Um, the Olympic team members. I mean, it was an insane package uh, of what you get to go. It, it did sound like correct. It is the ultimate kind of fan nutball package. So anybody want to guess what this package uh, costs for USA Cycling to go to the Olympics? And this is not including air for airfare. You have to get there. $25,000 a person. You heard that right. 25 grand to go to the Olympic bike races and stay in a nice hotel. You get a whole outfit that matches the USA's outfit, which, you know, what is that, a couple hundred bucks? You get to borrow a road bike. You don't get to bring it home. Uh, 25 grand. So 
I hope uh, they fill those slots. I know I will not be signing up for that anytime soon. Uh, what else? The 14-year-old, there's a 14-year-old kid who's racing his grandfather's bike. Why is this making a big deal? Why is this kind of crap go viral on the internet? I don't know. I'm so tired of things going viral. Even saying it makes me want to gag. Uh, this kid is 14. He's very, very fast, it sounds like. He started in downhill. Very Does very well. I think he's in California. Part of the school league, the NECA league, and all that stuff. And he's racing his grandfather's 1994 Merlin, Merlin tie hardtail as his bike. And that's what caught my eyes. Oh, 90s, you know, he's racing his 90s, grandpa's 90s bike. I'm like, wow, that's cool. You look further at the article and you go, okay, wait a minute here. They took the bike and completely refurbished it and modified it. They put a full axis drivetrain on it, you know, the older one. Uh, they put 27.5 inch wheels. They were able to cram those in. Um, it is a 26 inch bike back then, but they were able to fit them in there. They found an older Mazoki fork that would allow, you know, that size. It replaced all the, it, it's basic. It is a 94 frame, but I mean, honestly, the amount of money they put into this bike had carbon wheels. They might as well just bought the kid a really nice new bike, but that's not the point. The point is they're making a big deal out of it, and I think it's cool, but uh, as with all things on the internet, Mer Merlin, who's, I don't know if it's the same same Merlin as before, but it's there's still a company called Merlin making tie bikes. They, of course, make him an ambassador, send him a brand new modern bike, so I don't think he's riding the old bike much anymore. So there you go. So if you want a new bike and some fame, dig out that old 26-inch mountain bike and uh, start racing or give it to your kid or your grandkid and uh, have them win a couple races. Post it on social media. And you, too, can be Internet famous for riding an old mountain bike. Uh, Visma Lisa Bike Tour de France News. Why am I talking about Tour de France on here? Because I'm going to watch it. I kind of can't wait this year. There's a lot of angles going on with riders being crashed and sick and Mark Cavendish and Pidcock and Vanderpool. I think it's either going to be really boring or, or one of the best ones ever. The reason I bring this up is because they have a mobile data center. That's right. They have a van at the Tour de France. Looks like something from a spy movie, right? The entire van is full of screens and computers and all this stuff. And they're going to follow around, you know, the race and monitor everything about the riders and their bikes with a mobile data center. Of course, the UCI says, hey, wait a minute here. We got to check this out. And, you know, apparently there are limits as to what type of data um, teams can actually monitor, which is interesting. Glucose and hydration levels, they've got all these things wireless now. Um, the hydration level is kind of an interesting one. They'll be able to monitor each rider's individual um, hydration levels while they're riding. So is this going to be the new thing, uh, you know, where they show up with literally mobile data centers? I mean, that's in kind of insanity, isn't it? I guess not. If you're bolting all this electronics and monitors to the riders, you might as well drive around and monitor it. But it got me thinking, as it always does, are we going to start seeing, uh, you know, Specialized or Scott SRAM have a mobile data lab show up to the World Cup races? And they can monitor the riders at the uh, pre-rides or at the short track. I mean, they're already doing data analysis on suspension and tweaking things. And now you've got your uh, flight attendant is all, you know, is that data going to be live streamed into a van where somebody can sit there and see the data of how the suspension is working and make on the fly, imagine that making on the fly adjustments to the suspension while they're racing and send it back as they go through the pits uh, and kind of reprogram it. 
hey, where are things have happened? So that's kind of cool. But once one team does it, you know what? Right now, every single team is probably looking uh, for a lease. Uh, hey, go lease a new van and start filling it up with a bunch of crap. Uh, what else? I'll keep it short this week, this month, whatever it is. Specialized has a film. Um, it's her 50-year anniversary, in case you didn't notice that, uh, with the uniforms. But uh, there's a Mike Sinyard, uh, the founder of Specialized. He's got a film. And it goes through his garage, and it is quite an interesting video. I, If it didn't come up in your feed uh, when you were just bumming through YouTube, I highly suggest you look it up and watch it, because I found it extremely interesting. Uh, the guy started from quite literally zero, and of course built the company into one of the biggest in the world um, in a fairly short amount of time. So it's kind of neat. So if you're bored... Go look that up. One last thing. GCN. Everybody loves GMBN and GCN, right? I, I actually, when they first started, I loved it because the whole idea of watching uh, something like that on YouTube was fairly new. And I won't go into all the details. Everybody knows how GCN works. But they just announced, now that they're independent, they're no longer owned by Warner Brothers Discovery. They're back to the same, I believe, the same two founders. There's a man and a woman who founded it. They're they're the owners again. They're in full control. They've announced they're going back to a YouTube format only. No more website. No more streaming the races. They'll make some of those movies again. They got, I think, believe they got the rights to all those documentaries and movies back. And they're going to be adding some. But they announced uh, you can now be a member, a YouTube uh, member, and you, that's how you support them. Now you join, uh, it's just a fairly new concept. You join YouTube by paying monthly subscriptions. Oh my God, I hate subscriptions more than anything. And I got a lot of hate in me, don't I? Um, but the 200 it's $25, I believe, for the top tier and you don't actually, I think it starts at uh, five bucks and then it goes, then there's a $15 and then there's a $25 a month fee. And I, what do you get for these fees? From what I can tell, you don't get, you don't get anything. You get access to the, all those documentaries, 50 at a time, not even all of them. They're going to cycle through 50 of their, I think he said 200 separate videos they had made and accumulated. You'll be able to get 50 at a time, and that's kind of it. I mean, it's nice that you support them. I get that. Hey, I want to support them. I enjoy the content. But 300 bucks a year works kind of even 60 to 200 bucks a year for YouTube. I, I don't know. I'm not going to bother because there's very little content on there that I actually need to get. Uh, I wish them luck. They Simon and uh, whatever his name is, they've been on that show and channel for a very long time. So I, I want them to have a job and all that stuff, and they're good at what they do. But those prices are kind of nutty, and you don't really get anything back out of it other than what's already for free on there. So I don't know. So that's where we're at in the modern world. Pay 300 bucks, get nothing. Uh, extra. So hats off to them. That's it for this episode. Um, I blew this whole week off. I actually didn't ride my bike one time since the race. I went to a race on Sunday. I crapped up the race. It was terrible. I think I got second to last. I don't know what's going on this year. This is my worst results I've ever had. And I thought I was doing pretty good. I was riding plenty, doing some harder efforts. And I get out there and just suck so i gotta reanalyze so i got mad depressed and didn't ride this whole week and now it's raining so i can't ride even if i wanted to uh really so bummer i hope you guys have a good weekend and see you soon thank you ever so much for listening to short travel magazine